Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. Displayed are the news articles chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi and Tiruvannathapuram editions. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the time stamping for the displayed articles is provided in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the time stamping is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to the first article discussion. This article is about the Nirbhaya Fund. The discussion is relevant in prelim syllabus, in current events of national importance, then also in Indian polity and governance, particularly under public policy and rights issues, social sector initiatives. The discussion is also important in main syllabus under GS Paper 1 in the area role of women and women's organization and associated issues developmental issues, urbanization, their problems and their remedies. Then uh, the discussion is also relevant in GS paper 2 under functions and responsibilities of the union and the states, finances up to local levels and challenges therein. Then in government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. Next in welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the population by the centre and states and the performance of these schemes, mechanisms, laws, institutions and bodies constituted for the protection and betterment of these vulnerable sections. The news article mentions that the states and union territories have utilised less than 20% of the budget allocated to the states and union territories under the Nirbhaya Fund. This Nirbhaya Fund was allocated for safety of women by the central government between the years 2015 and 2018. A total sum of about Rs. 1813 crore was disbursed by the central government from 2015 to 2019. Now, based on the data on utilization details of the fund which was given by the Minister of Women and Child Development, out of this 1813 crores, around Rs. 854 crore was disbursed under 2018. Now, according to the data, in this uh, 854 crore, only 165 crore has been spent by various states and union territories. This is what the newspaper is saying as 20% of the budget allocated. This money was spent on different schemes launched by the center including other schemes of the local governments under the Nirbhaya Fund. So now let us see about the Nirbhaya Fund then we will get back to the news article. If you would have noticed particularly in the recent years we have been seeing many news regarding the violence and abuse against women and girls which happens frequently on streets, in public transportation and in other public places also. One such incident was the sexual assault of paramedical student which happened in New Delhi in the year 2012. Now these kinds of violence and abuse restricts the right to mobility of women which also discourages their freedom to walk freely and move in places such as public spaces of their own choice. So, in this context, the government of India has set up a dedicated fund called as Nirbhaya Fund. It was set up in the year 2013 for the implementation of initiatives which aims at enhancing the safety and security for women in the country. In other words, it can be said that the fund can be utilized for projects which are specifically designed to improve the safety and security of women. This fund is uh, administered by the Department of Economic Affairs under the Ministry of Finance. Also, this fund is a non-lapsable corpus fund. This means the fund which is allocated will be spent entirely to the specific item that is it will be spent only to increase the safety and security of women. Next the nodal ministry to appraise or evaluate and to recommend the proposals and schemes to be funded under the Nirbhaya fund is the ministry of women and child development or in short MWCD. Now along with this the ministry of women and child development has the responsibility to review and monitor the progress of sanctioned schemes along with the respective ministries or departments. So to get the funding under the Nirbhaya fund, the central government ministries or departments and the state governments and union territory administrations have to formulate a proposal and this proposal should constitute the 
issues related to the safety of women in their sector within the public sphere. Moreover, the proposed projects should have the following features. First, the proposal should have a direct impact on safety and security concerns of women. Then, the optimum use of existing infrastructure should be there. Then, innovative use of technology. Then, the proposed project should not be a duplication of existing government schemes or programs. Then, it should include the provision for real-time intervention. Uh, for example, the real-time monitoring of CCTV footage and quick response rather than just recording of events for evidence after the incident has occurred. Then the proposed project should also adhere to strict privacy and confidentiality of women's identity and information etc. These are some of the features that has to be imbibed in the proposal. Now, let us see some of the key schemes under which the states have been allocated money. First is the Emergency Response Support System or ERSS. It was introduced by the Ministry of Home Affairs. It aims to integrate all the emergency numbers to 112 with state of art technology that is using the best available technology. It envisages an integrated computer aided emergency response platform that responds to distress calls and ensure speedy assistance to the distressed persons. Next is the Central Victim Compensation Fund. Again, it was introduced by the Ministry of Home Affairs. This compensation fund was set up with an initial corpus fund, rupees 200 crores. This fund has been framed under section 357A of CRPC, that is Code of Criminal Procedure. The section 357A of CRPC requires every state government in coordination with the central government to prepare a scheme for providing funds for the purpose of compensation to the victim or his dependents who have suffered loss or injury as a result of the crime. and. Uh, who may also require rehabilitation because of the crime. Then next is the One Stop Center Scheme. It was introduced by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. The One Stop Center under the scheme is popularly known as Sakhi Centers. The One Stop Center Scheme is being implemented across the country since 1st April 2015. It aims at establishing centers to facilitate women who are affected by violence. It provides first aid, medical aid, police assistance, legal aid and counseling support. Then next is the Mahila Police Volunteer or MPVs. It was also introduced by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. The MPVs will act as a link between police and community and they will help the women in distress. Haryana is the first state to start the Mahila Police Volunteer Scheme. Keep in mind. Then is the Universalization of Women Helpline Scheme. It was also introduced by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. This helpline, which is specifically for women, has a common number across the country that will link the one-stop centers. The number is 181. The number 181 has been allocated to all states and union territories for women helpline. So, keep in mind that 181 number is the women helpline. Share it with your women friends. Then, if we see the funding pattern under the Nirbhaya Fund, it is about 60 is to 40 for the states, then 90 is to 10 for states with the difficult terrains, then 100 percent funding for union territories. So, initially, the Nirbhaya Fund was set up with a non lapsable corpus fund, which we saw earlier. It was about uh, of rupees. 1000 crore during the year 2013 to 14. Then further an amount of rupees 1000 crore was provided in 2014 to 15 and for the financial years 2016 to 17 and 2017 to 18 an amount of rupees 550 crore was provided under the Nirbhaya fund. Hence the corpus transferred to the public account for the Nirbhaya fund up to the year 2018 to 19 is rupees 3600 crore now. This is what the newspaper had mentioned and among this a total sum of about uh, rupees 1813 crore was disbursed by the central government from 2015 to 2019 okay so don't confuse next the article discusses about how the states have utilized the money disbursed under the nirbhaya fund so the top ranking states in terms of utilization of money across various schemes under the nirbhaya fund were mizoram which used around 56.32% then Uttarakhand which used about 51.68% and then Andhra Pradesh 
which was uh, around 43.23 percent and Nagaland which was around 38.17 percent. However, the government data shows that Chandigarh used or utilized about 59.83 percent of the fund that was dispersed which was even higher than the top ranking states and more money was utilized by Chandigarh than uh, what was allocated to it under the Central Victim Compensation Fund as well as under the Women Helpline Scheme. So, this performance by Chandigarh is a laudable one. Then the worst five states which either did not even spend a single penny that is which has utilized 0 percent or spent less than 1 percent of the money dispersed by the central government include the states of Uttar Pradesh, Manipur, Maharashtra, Lakshadweep and uh, it was followed by West Bengal which spent about 0 0.76 percent and Delhi of about 0.84 percent. Here what you have to note is that we saw in the beginning that one of the major push for introducing such a fund was the sexual assault which happened in the state of New Delhi and still Delhi did not use any money for 3 out of 4 schemes under which it was allocated a sum of rupees 35 crore. These include schemes for emergency support, women helpline and cyber crime prevention. Now, however, despite the poor record by states in using the money given to them, the center has continued to pump in or continue to give more cash for schemes like one stop scheme as well as universalization of women helpline scheme. Some of the example for this include Bihar which did not use even a single rupee out of uh, the money allocated for it under one stop centers between 2015 and 19, but uh, it was granted 3.9 crore again in 2019 and 2020. Similarly, Uttar Pradesh did not use any money from the allocated uh, already allocated money given to it for the women helpline scheme and yet it was granted rupees 46.5 lakh again in 2019. With this we have come to the end of this discussion. Moving on to the next news article discussion which is about one nation one ration card. The discussion is relevant in prelim syllabus under current events of national importance then in Indian polity and governance particularly under public policy. Then next in social development particularly in sustainable development, poverty, inclusion social sector initiatives etc. The discussion can also be linked to main syllabus under GS paper 2 in the area government policies and interventions for development in various sectors then in welfare schemes for vulnerable sections of the populations by the center and states then uh, in issues relating to development and management of social sector relating to health then also in issues relating to poverty and hunger. The discussion can also be linked to GS paper 3 and it is more important under the area public distribution system, its objectives, functioning and revamping and also in technology missions. The Union Minister of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution has announced that the government is moving towards one nation, one ration card. The one nation, one ration card scheme will allow the portability of food security benefits. It will be implemented in the whole country by June 30th, 2020 and it will be available across the country from July 1, 2020. This means every beneficiary especially the poor migrant workers will be able to buy subsidized rice and wheat from any ration shop in the country that is from any public distribution system shops in the country. This will happen only if their ration cards are linked to Aadhaar. The union minister also added that more than 85 percentage of people who are covered under the National Food Security Act that is NFSA have their ration cards linked to Aadhaar. See, this uh, Aadhaar linkage is not necessary to access the NFSA benefits. If the beneficiary is availing the benefits from the closest local ration shop to her home address, but to avail the portability scheme, it will be necessary to link the Aadhaar. Now, here the National Food Security Act legally entitles to receive subsidized food grains for up to 75 percent of rural population and for 50 percent of the urban population under the targeted public distribution system. Therefore, about two thirds of the Indian population is covered under the act to receive highly subsidized food grains. Now, for the implementation of the one nation one ration card scheme, all the states have been given one more year 
to arrange the point of sale machines that is POS machines in the ration shops. This is because the POS machine will be organizing the food grain distribution mechanism entirely. But if we see already 10 states are offering this portability within the state. It is called as integrated management of PDS that is IMPDS. In this IMPDS a beneficiary can avail his share of food grain from any district in the state. In these states 100% POS machines have been arranged for grain distribution and all PDS shops have been connected to the internet. The states which already have IMPDS are Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Haryana, Jharkhand, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Telangana and Tripura. And Delhi began to implement the portability but was stopped from implementing it because of some technical reasons. Then for other states such as Himachal Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Punjab and Tamil Nadu, uh, they can easily implement this scheme because they already have POS machines in all the ration shops. Now with regard to the availing of benefits under the scheme, the migrants would only be eligible for the subsidies supported by the center. This subsidy includes rice which is sold at rupees 3 per kg and wheat which is sold at rupees 2 per kg. This will be applicable even if a beneficiary moved to a state where grains were given for free. This means the migrant person would not be able to access those benefits given by that particular state government. This is because the state government subsidies are funded by the state exchequer that is the state treasury. Also this scheme will provide freedom to the beneficiaries as they will not be tied to any one PDS shop. This will reduce their dependence on shop owners and will also curtail the instances of corruption. The news also states that to reduce the nutrition deficiencies among beneficiaries, the center will roll out a pilot project. The food and PD department will be implementing a new centrally sponsored pilot scheme for fortification of rice and its distribution under public distribution system. This pilot scheme was given administrative approval already in February 2019. This scheme is to fortify rice that is uh, to boost the nutrition content of rice with iron, folic acid, vitamin A and vitamin B12. The pilot scheme has been approved with a total budget outlay of rupees 147.61 crores. It is for a period of 3 years which will begin in the period of 2019 to 20. The pilot scheme would be funded by the government of India in the ratio of 90 is to 10 with respect to northeastern hilly and island states and 75 is to 25 with respect to the rest of the states. The pilot scheme will focus on 15 districts which will be one district per state. At present 9 states have agreed to start the scheme and they have also identified the districts. These states are Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Karnataka, Kerala, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu and Assam. This pilot scheme is one of the elected government's 100 days agenda. Now the fortified rice which we mentioned already will be available in ration shops from November onwards but also know that the Ministry of Women and Child Development and the Ministry of Human Resource Development have already been providing rice fortified with nutritious elements in the Anganwadi centers and also in the midday meal scheme. With this we have come to the end of this discussion. Moving on to the next news article discussion which is about the RCEP that is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. The analysis will be relevant in your prelims preparation under current events of national and international importance. Then the analysis will also be relevant in your mains preparation under bilateral, regional and global groupings and agreements involving India and or affecting India's interests and then also under effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interests. We know that the RCEP is the acronym for Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. The idea of RCEP was announced by ASEAN that is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations in the year 2012. The concept of the RCEP was promoted by ASEAN countries in 2011 but an RCEP declaration came at the ASEAN summit in 2012 and uh, negotiators met for the first time in 2013 only. 
Now, RCEP is considered as the world's biggest free trade agreement. It is a proposed free trade agreement between 10 ASEAN countries with its 6 free trade agreement partners. The 6 free trade agreement partners are India, China, Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea. If you see this RCEP includes countries that make up to 45 percent of the world's population. Then RCEP's GDP makes up for 33 percent of world's GDP. Next the trade that happens between the RCEP partners are at least 28 percent of total global trade. If the RCEP is concluded by the end of this year that is 2019 then the author feels that it will bring stability to the unpredictable world market. Then the author has mentioned about certain issues that are likely to arise. First if RCEP is concluded it could make the world trade less flexible. Then China would dominate RCEP. Then if you see most RCEP members also conduct substantial trade with the United States. So, the ongoing US China trade war may force many RCEP members to take sides. Some may support US and some may support China. So, this would cause geopolitical rift or conflict within the group even before it is fully formed. Now, generally ASEAN summits are held biannually that is twice a year. The next ASEAN summit that is the 35th ASEAN summit is about to be held in November 2019 in Bangkok. It would be closely watched by the entire world as everyone is in the anticipation of what would happen next. And also ASEAN grouping is pushing all the stakeholders to conclude talks before the next summit and take RCEP forward. Then the 34th ASEAN summit recently ended in Bangkok. In this summit, the Malaysian Prime Minister has told that he is willing to push through the trade agreement without India for the time being. Others said all 16 members must agree on the final RCEP document which includes India also. But the problem is that India has some concerns in signing this RCEP. Along with India, Australia and uh, New Zealand have raised concerns about joining this partnership for their own reasons. We saw that RCEP negotiators met for the first time in 2013. If you see, 6 years is over now. But till date, RCEP has not yet been finalized. The main stumbling block or the problems in signing this RCEP as mentioned in this news article are the India-China trade relationship, which is the concern of India. Then uh, some concerns from Australia and New Zealand's side are on labor and environmental protections. So, we can see that except these three countries, all the other countries are supporting RCEP. In May this year, that is 2019, China proposed a plan to conclude the negotiations without those who are objecting to the agreement. And the objecting countries are India, Australia and New Zealand. So, China said they can join later if they wish to. If you see, the Malaysian Prime Minister also said the same after the ASEAN summit, which was held last week. But this move was opposed by most of the countries in the RCEP grouping. One of the ASEAN diplomats has said that there is no point without India in RCEP, meaning India cannot be left out in RCEP since India's market size is huge and the trade opportunities are also very huge. Even India has got many reasons to stay in the deal since staying out of RCEP means it would hurt the sentiments of ASEAN grouping. And uh, this would be a bigger challenge for India to engage with ASEAN countries through the act east policy if India does not stay in the deal. Then India would also lose the chance to frame the RCEP groupings rules and investment standards if it fails to join the RCEP at this stage. Now let us see why India is holding up the deal or what are the concerns of India with respect to RCEP. India's chief concern with RCEP is that it needs to protect its economy from the flooding of cheap imports from China. If you see out of all the countries of RCEP, India is the only one which does not have a free trade agreement with China. India is not even considering to have any bilateral or multilateral negotiations for a free trade agreement with China because 
the major worry is that if India has free trade agreement with China, then duty free trade will happen because China wants zero tariffs for over 90 percentage of the goods. So, we can see that the Chinese goods will be dumped into Indian market and ultimately it will affect the Indian manufacturers. If you see several industry groups have already petitioned the Indian government not to go ahead with the RCEP. This includes the steel and aluminum industry, copper industry, pharmaceutical industry and also the textile industry. All these would suffer because of the dumping of Chinese goods if RCEP agreement is signed. Then if you see India has free trade agreement with ASEAN. From this graph you can see that India's exports have increased at least by 50 percent since the free trade deal has come into force since 2010. Now even before this RCEP agreement is signed India already has trade deficits with 11 of the 15 other RCEP countries. If you see this table, India has a huge trade deficit with China, South Korea and Indonesia. Trade deficit means exports minus imports. Here minus or negative value means India has trade deficit, positive value means India has trade surplus which means India's exports to those countries are more than what it imports from those countries. Because of this trade deficit, the government is very cautious about moving ahead in RCEP. Next, India has also asked for strict rules of origin markings on all goods. So, they do not come in through a third country. This has been proposed by India with factor of China in mind. If a country of origin of the product is not mentioned, then China will dump its products through the other RCEP partners. Hence, India has asked for stricter rules of origin. In addition to this, India wants to ensure the free flow of services that is the manpower which is nothing but the laborers to RCEP countries as well. This simply means that India wants to access the RCEP partners services market. But it is believed that if this is agreed in RCEP, then the other partners of RCEP would tighten their immigration laws in the future. So, we can see that RCEP partners are negotiating on market access for goods, services and investment as well as negotiating on rules of origin, intellectual property and e-commerce. Now, the other partners of RCEP are, are trying to convince India. If you see in the coming future, ASEAN will be sending representatives to India to push forward the negotiations. Then uh, already China has also sent its representatives. It has assured to reduce the trade deficit that India currently has with China. Also in the last year RCEP summit, few members convinced to postpone the agreement by one year due to elections in India, Indonesia, Thailand and Australia. Now that as the elections have been concluded, this year that is 2019 will be a crucial year to conclude the RCEP agreement. We will wait and see what happens. With this we have come to the end of this discussion. The displayed practice mains question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article which is about G20. We will be seeing two news articles related to G20 today as well. The analysis of both the news articles will be relevant in your prelims preparation under current events of national and international importance. The analysis will also be relevant in your mains preparation under bilateral, regional and global groupings and agreements involving India and or affecting India's interests. And then also under effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interests. Yesterday we saw about G20 in detail. We saw that G20 means the group of 20 and the G20 grouping consists of 19 countries plus the European Union. Then we also saw 8 countries who were the member of the grouping throughout the analysis yesterday. Then we also had a practice question yesterday with respect to the members of G20. So now you would be in a position to tell the 8 members of G20 which we saw yesterday. So let us recollect them now. They are India, Japan, European Union, USA and 4 member nations from BRICS which are Brazil, Russia, China and South Africa. Now in today's news article it is mentioned that Indian Prime Minister held bilateral meetings with the leaders of Brazil, Indonesia, 
Turkey, Australia, Singapore and Chile. From this news article, you know five more countries which are members of this G20 groupings. They are Indonesia, Turkey, Australia, Singapore and Chile along with the other eight member countries which we saw yesterday. So now we know 13 out of the 20 countries of this G20 grouping. We will be having more news articles on G20 and we will see the rest of the countries in the coming days. So if you develop this habit of reading the newspaper daily and going with the flow of current affairs, it will definitely reduce the burden on your preparation. Always try to analyze the news instead of blindly memorizing the content. Analysis will help you eliminate certain options logically in the examination hall and then you can easily relate the news with certain incidents when you develop this habit of reading the newspaper daily. Now let us move on to the news article discussion. In this bilateral meeting between Indian Prime Minister and the leaders of uh, these six countries of Brazil, Indonesia, Turkey, Australia, Singapore and Chile, some key issues were discussed. The issues were based on trade, counter-terrorism, defense, maritime security and sports. If you see the newspaper, it has mentioned that issues and maritime fronts were discussed with Indonesia. From this we can assume that Indonesia shares border with seas and we can tell that it is not a landlocked country. Also know that Indonesia is the largest archipelago. Archipelago means a sea or stretch of water having many islands and Indonesia is one of such islands and it is one of the largest and Indonesia consists of five main islands namely Sumatra, Java, Kalimantan, Sulawesi and Papua. It has a total of 17,000 plus islands to be exact 17,508 islands. The entire country stretches to about 5,150 kilometer between the Australian and Asian continental mainland and in Indonesia also divides the Pacific and Indian Oceans at the equator. See just from knowing that Indonesia is a part of G20 and India and Indonesia has bilateral talks on maritime security, we have also seen the physical geography of Indonesia with this one term maritime because this term is related or connected with seas. So try to briefly know about the countries in this manner. When you start to try to know about one new country in a day like this, then you will find interesting to know certain other important facts or best practices in that country's polity or society or environment. You can even quote them as examples in any of relevant mains examination questions. Now this is how you should analyze the newspaper and connect things without the need to blindly memorize them. Now the news article also mentions that India had bilateral talks with Brazil on biofuels and uh, it had bilateral talks with Turkey on counter terrorism. Now try to analyze the reason for these talks and uh, post it in the comment section. Then there is one more news that India and Australia has bilateral talks on maritime cooperation and Indo-Pacific. If you see Australia is a part of Quad grouping but not a part of Malabar exercise. Quad is a informal strategic security dialogue between four countries that are India, USA, Japan and Australia and Malabar is a trilateral naval exercise between three of these four countries where Australia is not a part of but Australia wants to join and India is refusing its admission. Now there is one more news article which is titled G20 resolves to free internet of extremism. In this G20 summit all the leaders have resolved to prevent the use of the internet to fund and facilitate terror and extremism. The leaders have said that while the internet must be open, free and secure, it could not serve as a safe haven which means a safe place for terrorists. The G20 leaders have released a statement. The statement says that all the G20 leaders are committed to protecting people from violent extremism conducive to terrorism or in short VECT. This will be done through the exploitation of the internet. First we need to see what is meant by violent extremism. There is no internationally agreed definition on violent extremism but according to UNESCO violent extremism is the beliefs and actions of people who support or use violence to achieve ideological, religious or political goals. 
This includes terrorism and other forms of politically motivated and communal violence. Next, let us see what is meant by terrorism. If you see, there is no internationally agreed definition on terrorism as well. But in the 8th report of 2nd ARC report, that is the Administrative Reforms Commission report of India, the report defines what is meant by terrorist act as per the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act of 1967 and we know that this act was amended in 2004. Now, based on this report, terrorist act means any person acting with intent to strike terror or fear in the people by using weapons that will cause the death or injuries to the person or that will damage any of the property of the government. Now, let us see the context of this news article. It speaks about the violent extremism conducive to terrorism or VECT through the exploitation of the internet. It means the violent extremism which is conducive to or which might lead to terrorism through internet should be prevented. The G20 leaders have called for complete implementation of the UN Global Counter-Terrorism Strategy and they have also called for complete implementation of the 2017 Hamburg G20 leaders statement on counter-terrorism. Now, let us see about this UN Global Counter-Terrorism Strategy in brief. If you see, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Global Counter-Terrorism Strategy on 8th September 2006. The strategy aims to enhance national, regional and international efforts to counter terrorism. The leaders have also agreed in the summit that such efforts must respect human rights and then the freedom of expression and then the access to information also. They have told that the internet must not be safe haven or a safe place for terrorists to recruit, incite or prepare terrorist act. They have also committed to collaborate with states international organizations, industries and civil societies for counter-terrorism measures. With this, we have come to the end of our article discussion session. The display practice question will be discussed in the next session. Moving on to the last session for the day, that is the practice questions discussion session. If you look at the first question, it states that consider the following statements. It has given two statements here. The first statement is the members of BRICS nations are also members of G20 grouping. So, you should know who are the members of BRICS nations. The members or the member countries of BRICS nations are Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. And uh, if you have listened to our analysis from yesterday and today's, you can say that these five countries are also part of G20 groupings. So, this makes first statement as the correct statement. Now, if you look at the second statement, it states the members of quad grouping are also members of G20 grouping. Now, quad means four. So, obviously, quad grouping consists of four nations. Those four nations are India, Japan, USA and Australia. And based on today's analysis, you can say India is definitely a member of G20. And we know that Japan and Australia and USA are also the members of G20 grouping, which makes the second statement as the correct statement. Since the question has asked for the correct statements, as both the statements are correct, the correct answer to this question is option C, both 1 and 2. Now, let us see one main question based on GS paper 2. What is RCEP? What are the concerns of India which is holding up India's entry into the trade pact? Now, here the first part of the question has asked what is RCEP? So, first you should know RCEP is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Then you can mention about the agreement and its importance in terms of trade benefits for India. Then you can also mention some of the statistics from the analysis which has compared the value of RCEP in terms of global importance. Then for the second part of the question which asks what are the concerns of India which is holding India from its entry into the trade pact. Now, we have seen the concerns during our analysis such as uh, China's goods will flood Indian markets if uh, we sign the trade pact, then it will affect uh, Indian domestic industries and manufacturing companies. Then uh, you can also talk about the trade deficit India has if it enters into a free trade agreement. Then uh, you can also talk about uh, the 
insistence of India on marking the goods with the country of origin. Then you can also say about the India's request for access to service sector of other RCEP partners. We had a very detailed discussion about this during our analysis. Then you can finally conclude the answer with RCEP's relevance for India. With this, we have come to the end of our uh, Hindu news analysis. If you like the video, don't forget to like, comment and share. And do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates on civil service examination preparation.